I want to say what's up to everybody. Davey D hanging out with you this afternoon. And what we want to talk about is a movie and the surrounding issues of that movie that we haven't seen the likes of in a very, very long time. We're talking about Django, or actually Django, and the type of conversation it spurs all across the nation. Pro, con, issues around slavery, who gets to talk about these sorts of things, historical accuracies and inaccuracies, and what have you. And we have a, a wonderful roundtable of filmmakers and uh, cultural critics that are going to be joining us, but we wanted to kick this conversation off this afternoon with a good friend of ours. He's a professor. He's a historian. Um, he's somebody who wrote a, a very detailed article in The New Yorker. He's also a contributor to MSNBC and CNN, among other things. We're talking about uh, Professor Jelani Cobb. Jelani, welcome, man. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, let me just start off with the obvious question. Um, are you surprised at how much conversation movies like Django has generated? Including getting you to, uh, you know, write an article. Uh, I'm surprised by it. I, I didn't expect it to. Well, one, I wasn't expecting the movie, the film, to be what it was, um, and then I was surprised that it garnered the reaction that it has, and that the conversation has been so intense and so enduring. So, yeah, it was it was um, telling that you know we we avoid slavery. We usually avoid discussions of race in this country, and now we're like deeply enmeshed in a, in a conversation about race. Is it because we um, are so hungry to have that information that we haven't talked about uh, that, that any opportunity we were going to jump on the, uh, on the bandwagon, so to speak, and really weigh in? I don't think so. I think it has something to do with the precise and particular nature of this film. Okay. Uh, I think we hadn't seen anything quite like this. Um, you know, before or, or recently, uh, and it opened up a door for us to have a conversation about how, not only about how we perceive slavery, uh, about the actual history of slavery, but how we perceive it and how we imagine it uh, and what is appropriate, uh, you know, what are the proper ways to discuss, you know, these horrific elements of the past, uh, what ways do we, in what ways do we not want to discuss it? Uh, I think all those things were wrapped up in this film. Right. Let me ask you this. If you could kind of give some bullet points of your wonderful article in The New Yorker that you really wanted to get across. I know you did the analysis with that and Inglorious Bastards, um, but you also put some accuracy in terms of history there, which is really your area of expertise. Right. So um, let's start with this. When, when I first started talking about the film, the first thing people would say is that um, you know, my, the criticisms I raised about history were uh, you know, invalid or we shouldn't be talking about this because the movie never purported to be about history. Um, and I didn't think that was a valid argument because in reality, when we think about Westerns, you know, most Westerns never said that they were actually depicting events from you know, the history of the American West, but they still shaped the ways in which we understood, the ways in which we viewed the West. Right. And so I remember uh, the Native American writer Sherman Alexi saying that he had to grow up to understand how wrong it was that he would watch the movies, the Westerns, and cheer for the Cowboys, not the Indians, right? And so the ways in which history can be shaped, um, our perception of history can be shaped is sometimes easier in a film that doesn't purport to be about history than one that does. Right. We look at, you know, Lincoln, for instance, we're going to be looking to see whether or not something is accurate. But we have something that's supposedly fictional. Sometimes those messages um, come through even more clearly. And so my concern with the movie was, um, you know, manifold. One, given uh, his track record, you know, in, in previous movies, uh, We're you know, about like Quentin Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino, the director, uh, given tw Tarantino's track record um, in Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown, I wasn't comfortable with his use of the word nigger um, as often as it was used. I mean, some people said, "Well, oh, this is a movie about slavery." If ever it's appropriate, then it's here. But given the fact that he's used it in excess in films that had nothing to do with slavery, it seemed that the movie that which was about slavery set up a kind of valid excuse to use a term that he already has a fixation with. Um, and it was used with such numbing frequency that I think I said in the article that had he used the word uh, one more time, it would have required Billing as a co-star. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and so there's that. Uh, in addition, uh, there were some kind of implications of it. So we see this film about an ex-slave, a rebellious ex-slave who's set on a mission, uh, who turns bounty hunter and goes on a mission to, to save his, um, his still enslaved wife uh, from a plantation which is owned by a character played by Leonardo DiCaprio named Calvin Candy. And so in the film, the only individual we see who has a real uh, antagonism towards slavery, the only person who we see who's willing to be um, you know, violently rebellious if necessary is Jamie Foxx's character, Django. And I thought that did violence to the history of slavery. Mm. Um, we understand him, as, as he said, Calvin Candy says at one point, you know, as one person in 10,000 who's willing to, uh, to violently fight against slavery. And he later sarcastically refers to himself as that one person in 10,000. But that's the inverse of it. We know the history of slavery is that there's been lots of resistance, not just simple, simply the one hero who rides in and decides that he's had about enough. Right. Well, I think, um, I think your comments, and for those that are listening on radio, we're talking with Jelani Cobb, and those who are watching, uh, Jelani Cobb is on our screen with us. Uh, the whole comparison with the Western, I think, is very telling because that has shaped our opinions about the, uh, uh, the West. Uh, many people now justify the taking of land, and they reference those Western movies directly or subconsciously. And even more importantly, it's made the Native American either become the noble savage, who speaks very f infrequently, just says one word, hi, Tonto, or whatever. And, um, and it, for the most part, they've been invisible with our history. So that, that I think is very problematic. And the last point, which I'll make, which I think is also interesting, when I saw Django, there were big advertisements for the, the Disney all out blockbuster remake of The Long Ranger and Tonto. So we're gonna have a rewriting or we're gonna have a reintroduction introduction of that Western narrative coming down the pipe in a minute. We're going to be having this conversation in a couple of months, except we're going to be dealing with the Native American experience, because most of the people I know who are Native, uh, Native American, especially in the age of idol no more, they ain't having it. They're not having Tonto <laughs> show up on the horse and support this, uh, this character the way that he did in years past. And and let's bear in mind that Tonto is being played by Johnny Depp. You know, white, that's, oh, white. that's right. He is Johnny Depp. That's right. So they couldn't even get a Native American actor. Right, right. Well, uh, and so I, go ahead. I think those were, the concerns, those were the concerns that I had, that simply saying that something is fantasy doesn't mean that it doesn't reflect how we think about history <laughs> and it doesn't shape how we think about history um, you know, pr moving forward. And so uh, in addition to that, there's a character that they create um, you know, which is played by Samuel L. Jackson, a character named Stephen, who is the uh, stereotypical house slave who immediately becomes an antagonist of Django. Um, and, you know, with uh, spoilers, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you might want to close your ears. But, you know, Stephen is the last person that Django has to kill in order to be free. And they set it up that his true antagonist, Django's true antagonist, is not Calvin Candy, the plantation owner, but is Stephen, the house slave. Uh, and I thought that was very presumptuous and disrespectful, you know, for a white director to set up that kind of dynamic uh, wherein uh, you have a black person, you know, the really ultimate fight is between two black people in slavery. Mm. Um, I thought was was duplicitous and disingenuous. Right. Well, you know, Jelani, we can go on and we are going to continue on with our roundtable discussion, but I'm glad you set a precedent uh, for looking at this historical uh, scenario. Uh, one quick question, if you could briefly summarize uh, two or three points about Lincoln, you know, using your historical understanding. What's missing in Lincoln that definitely should have been there? The shortest summary is black people. <laughs> <laughs> no Frederick Douglass in Lincoln. There's no Frederick Douglass in Lincoln. As I understand, Frederick Douglass was part of the original script, uh, but did not make it into this draft. And, you know, I story the story of black people in history in general, like there and originally, and then somehow or another didn't make it into the final version. Um, and so uh, the Lincoln that we see in this film is a fully formed moral individual, understands that uh, slavery is abominable and has to be ended. Uh, and 
Lincoln took a long route to come into that position. The other thing, he, he's brought to that position by the constant pressure placed upon him by people like Frederick Douglass, by black people who were enslaved, um, you know, who are consistently escaping and, and uh, trying to join the Union forces and the Union trying to f having to figure out what they're going to do with these people who have this very ambiguous status. Uh, and so these th things place pressure on Abraham Lincoln to adopt increasingly more progressive positions as it relates to slavery. Beyond this, uh, one of the film makes crucial or fails a crucial decision was that Lincoln is a uh, opponent of slavery uh, because he advocates racial equality. In real life, in actual history, there was no reason to suspect that Lincoln believed in racial equality. Right. He uh, disdained slavery, that is, he disliked slavery, uh, but he did not believe that blacks and whites were equal. And in fact, at various points, his uh, ideas for emancipation were partnered with his plans for the removal of the entire black right. population from the, the United the, States. The deportion. I'm going to stop you right there, Jelani. We appreciate it. Uh, we can uh, look for your article in the New Yorker magazine. Um, we can see you on panels and uh, frequently on MSNBC and other uh, places where you are uh, sharing your information. We're going to uh, open this up and let our panel weigh in because they're chomping at the bit. And uh, I think they're going to be able to build off of the foundation that you laid out this afternoon. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jelani Cobb, thank you so much, man. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We're back here. Big shout out to Jelani Cobb, who was breaking down a lot of history for us. Well, we now want to turn our attention to our panel discussion. And we have some esteemed folks that are in the building with us. Uh, they are filmmakers. They are image creators. They are community folks who um, really push the envelope in terms of changing the perception that us as African Americans are dealing with. And among the folks that we have is filmmaker Idris Hassan. Uh, she is over here with us this afternoon. Um, one of the people, I'll let her talk about some of her projects. We also have Sean Kennedy, a uh, well known uh, entrepreneur in the city of Oakland, and also somebody who has put out a project called Good News Oakland, designed specifically to change the image. Uh, that has plagued this city, and in particular, its African-American residents. And then we have Dwayne Dudafil, uh, somebody who's a cultural, I'll call you a cultural ambassador, uh, somebody who's part of the Maroon Society uh, that's dealing with images, and uh, he is here to join us as well. Um, let me start off with you, Dwayne. Uh, we've been talking about Django and using this uh, opportunity to look at the institution of slavery, um, unearth history that's been buried and to look at some of the issues above and beyond and as I was saying with Jelani this movie sparked something within many folks Absolutely. to really start coming and talking about it we haven't seen this in a very long time I mean Oprah did a special they did a special on you know free speech I mean everywhere you go and it's like let's talk about this so what do you think is really driving this well, it, it's the it's the thrust of the Hollywood's power in terms of, of putting images in the in the public eye. It's not as if slave slave narratives or the Af or the African enslavement narrative hasn't been covered in film before and covered much much better. So I, I wanted to you know along with what you're saying here differentiate between the slave narrative and the narrative of enslaved Africans in America. So that's the main difference I think. Also that this type of a slave narrative is more palatable as entertainment. In other words, you have the snipped off, you know, cultural heritage basically of these African people in in the Americas. The slave narrative is more palatable and commercially viable than is the narrative of uh, enslaved African people like you would find in a film like Sankofa or Quilombo and things like that. But well, when you look at some of those uh, films like a Sankofa, you're usually dealing with rebellion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and some people have made the case, well, this is an empowering film because we did get to see somebody rebel. So what's the difference between a Sankofa oh. 
Oh, and and what we saw with Django, even though we know it's fantasized, but sure, sure, oh, huge, huge difference. Uh, again, there's the difference between Django being someone whose personality seems to emerge uh, as this white man uh, whose name is King Schultz comes and gives him some purpose in life, and also superimposes this German myth narrative on top of his journey. He's he becomes Siegfried now. He's you know journeying after Brunhilde because he's you know he's Siegfried. This is something completely different from what you would find in Sankofa, where as you have Akan philosophy showing up in Sankofa, the Sankofa bird, the notion of return, right? And so there's a spiritual journey that this woman goes through in Sankofa as she's freeing herself. She kills the person that, that rapes her in the film. She's an empowered um, black woman, which you don't find in Django as well. Yeah, uh, you find the empowered black woman and you find empowered black men in there like Sean Goes leading this maroon bellion in the, in, the, uh, in the hills. And he's portrayed by uh, the great rap uh, and, and reggae artist named Muta Baruka. Mm -hmm. so, so you have different narratives going on in those, in those, they're qualitatively different things. Django is an individual whose you know, personality emerges, like I said before, as he's given purpose by this white man, and he becomes one in 10,000, as William Jelani, Jelani Cobb you know, brought off for right. us here. Well, let me bring uh, you in, Idris, filmmaker. Uh, Somebody who, you know, from my understanding, got behind the camera because you didn't like the images that were out there. You were like sick and tired of being tired, you know. When you see a movie like this come out, um, and maybe you can share with us some of the work that, you've, that you're doing, mm -hmm. does it enhance it? Does it mean more opportunities? Or does it create more of a challenge for you? Wow. Um, this movie is very interesting. For one, like you said, it is sparking a lot of dialogue, a lot of conversation. There's opinions across the board. Is it a good movie? What is it doing? Is it, you know, he's freeing the people. It's empowering for black people. But at the same time, I think when you have a machine such as the Quentin Tarantino machine, he's almost in some ways rewriting history. People are now quoting a Django film as examples of history. Oh, Samuel Jackson, that's exemplified as the house Negro. That's who you look to as the worst house Negro you've ever seen in a documented format. But and I think that's where it becomes problematic. In my work, I try to do a lot of documenting of things that are happening in the community, everyday occurrences like Malcolm X jazz festivals, people doing art, people reaching out to kids, women telling their stories about dealing with domestic violence. And a lot of my work does cover the spectrum of the African American community. Again, because I feel that in our history, as we've seen filmmaking come into play just as a medium, the birth of a nation and those kind of films always dictating this is how black people are gonna look and this is how European folks are supposed to deal with them. And I think that the Django is bringing that same play into it, even though he's at the end. Well, you said something that's interesting to me because a lot of the discussion around Django has been, you know, just to kind of uh, summarize a typical narrative is that if we put this false history out, our kids are going to soak it up and then they're going to think that's what slavery was about, It blah, blah, blah. But you just kind of alluded that, you know, there's other people that's watching this. You know, it's not just black folks. When I saw it, it was no black folks in the theater, but it was sold out, you know. And, uh, you know, this is on the borders of Texas, you know, and it was sold out for a week. You know, I had to wait like four or five days before I could actually go into a theater that seats 300 people to see it. You know, and that's how popular it was. So the question becomes, should we be concerned how other people will perceive this and then react? I think definitely yes, because I was with you, the theater I went to was mostly Europeans um, watching this film and you could see where the niggerisms came in and they're making fun and Samuel Jackson's being just really, I don't know the word, but um, you could see the European folks were laughing. It was amusement, and there was, oh, was look at this. Too. There was funny parts, too, but these parts that I'm talking about weren't the funny parts. Mm -hmm. There was amusement happening where it wasn't f funny, where there was atrocities, where there was degradation, there was laughter. But, and vice versa, where there was retaliation, where there was the so-called empowering scene for Django, silence. What if Tyler Perry did this movie, or... Spike Lee did this. Would we have a problem with it? Is it really because it's, you know, Quentin Carantino that's doing this, mm -hmm. white guy doing it, you know, and, but, you know, what if you did it? 
or you know, or somebody else, would it would it would it make a difference? It depends. It depends. Um, I don't know if the Tyler Perrys of the world necessarily go and consult history verbatim when they're dealing with the film. Um, even Spike Lee in some cases, I don't know if he's quoting history verbatim when he's producing his films. So there are some challenges there, but for me it's like, okay, well, European folks have told our stories for so long. Maybe if Quentin Tarantino didn't do it, it wouldn't be so much of a spark. Um, but because he did do it, there is some kind of outrage, there is some kind of, oh my goodness, what's going on. I don't you have Reggie Hudlin as mm -hmm. a producer, mm -hmm. you have Jamie Foxx and Samuel Jackson, you have a star-studded cast. And can we deny the fact that there are a lot of people in our community that thought this was an empowering movie? Uh, there were many people, you know, Jamie Foxx talks about crying on the set and the whole nine. So is there some value to that or? Well, I would say yes, yes and no. To some degree, there is a value, again, because it is presenting a narrative of enslaved Africans that maybe a lot of masses of black people haven't done that level of research. They don't even know the basis of what happened to us during the Maafa or you know, transatlantic slave trade. So to see something on, the, on film where it's like, all you've been taught is that you were a slave, that's your history. And you see somebody empowering and, and killing. And you know, I, when he whipped the white man before he was about to whip the sister, I, I, was, in, I was in sight, I was excited. I was, I admit it. <laughs> but overall, it's just like, we need to dig deeper into our own history. We need to dig deeper into our own narratives and really understand like, who is the real Django? Does it do anybody, you right. know, do, do that research? I hope that this film would spark that kind of thing okay. in, in folks. Sean Kennedy, you know, um, we were on a panel a long time ago, maybe about five, six years ago, and you had brought up something. We were talking about the Afrocentric period in hip hop when everybody's talking about fight the power and everybody was wearing the Malcolm X chains and all that. And I remember you talking about that. Yeah, folks wore those hats and folks wore those uh, chains, but they're also selling dope, <laughs> putting the uh, things behind them and didn't necessarily pick up the meaning. And I, I want to bring this up and start off with that um, to your journey of somebody who has you know, deliberately trying to change the image of Oakland. Um, at that point in time, there was a renaissance in black entertainment where everybody was saying, if only we had more images. So you had Spike Lee do his fight the power thing. You had the public enemies, you had the KRS-1s. You had an onslaught of images. But from what I gathered when we, had, when we were on that panel, there was a lot of people that just didn't pick that up. Or maybe they did and they just didn't really digest it in the way that we would see. And now, you know, some odd years later, 20 years later, we have somebody like yourself who's changing the images or the perception using film and using all that information. And I want to, you know, from your perspective, what do you think about, you know, what's happened over 20 years in terms of what we digest, what we don't digest, um, and what's, what, is, what is it really going to take for us to start taking in images critically and moving in another direction in terms of how we perceive? Um, well, when it comes to what we digest, I think um, we are just spoiled to the fact that there's this big table of food and we just sit down and eat without thinking about the things that we are digesting. It is um, these images that continue to come at us that are well-designed images um, that are created by people who uh, are psychologists who actually graduate with these PhDs that create the things that we are about to digest. And the unfortunate part about what has happened over the last 25 years when we did have this level of consciousness, like you said, I question the fact that what did this level of consciousness mean? Um, you know, I wrote a rap back in the day when I was a rapper, like every other kid was, and I said, um, a little quote was, um, you wear the African peace sign on your neck, but you just killed a brother for six count on the set. What does it mean? Is it life that you value or a bullet to the brain for a scandalous power? And um, <clears throat> so I saw a lot of that, you know, brothers on the street being conscious, but yet still dead with that thing around their neck that was supposed to liberate them from everything else, you know? Um, so what has happened, I think, um, is that our culture was studied even then. 
and it was tested. It was it was given back to us in the things that we were doing, and it was sold to us. So I think over that period of time, when we talk about um, the Spike Lees and the and the and the Public Enemies and those type of groups that were trying to change our image back then, um, I think that the popular image and it prevailed was the NWA image. And the reason why that image was, was, was popular because the gangsters was really hiding behind the African American, I mean the African peace sign. It was really gangsters. They was really gonna do that anyway. That was just a cover. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was just a shield to say I was something else that I wasn't. So what, what I think the industry did was just really capitalize on that by continuing to feed and create the marketing strategies that it took to keep that media inside of our face. Talk about with Good News Oakland. So you come from those rough streets in, in East Oakland. You seen the type of uh, uh, negativity that is often associated with the city. You know, I, I remember teaching a class and showing them a headline coming out of the San Francisco Chronicle. One was from 2002 when there was a celebration in Oakland after the uh, 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 Raiders went to the uh, uh, Super Bowl. And the other one was the headline in that same San Francisco Chronicle when they lit about six or seven bonfires in San Francisco. And I showed the class and one in Oakland said, you know, uh, raving maniacs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> upset the city of Oakland. And then the one in San Francisco was like, you know, delirious fans, you know, party hard in the street as they're setting bonfires. And you see the same picture, you know, cars flipped over and all that. But I brought that up to the class to say, like, wow, this same paper in the same area. But look at how, you know, here you had just one car that was flipped over and burnt up. And it, but, and it was like the entire city was just a thug city as a result. Here you had buses being smashed, you know, windows being broken all kind of stuff after the Giants win the World Series, and it's just delirious fans partying hard, you know? And that sort of thing has plagued many, not just in Oakland, but in Detroit, Chicago, any place where you find large black populations. So talk about the, you know, understanding that sort of dynamic. What is the approach that you've been taking to now try to change that image using some of these tools that have been used against us? Well, um, now we're, you know, the, the bigger picture of all that is that's institutional racism. So, I mean, that's a whole nother can of worms, but um, the tools that we have today that we didn't have before is the fact that we have the internet, we have YouTube, we have bloggers and things of that nature. We have places and domains that we can put our own story up and let people read what's happening in our current day culture and history. Um, what brings me to to say I just finished teaching an oral history class, video oral history class with young people. And, and my job was to let them tell what's happening right now, their story during this historic period of Barack Obama and the things that are happening in America. And, and we never hear that narrative because that narrative is when you go to the libraries or the archives and you look for the stories and the headlines that talk about the things that were happening during that time. You only see those headlines that were written by individuals who had other things in mind other than, you know, looking out for us. So now we live in a day that we actually are archiving our history because of social networking and we are able to tell our own story. So now we have the power, like right now, you know, um, to have cameras that's this big do a television show didn't exist, you know what I'm saying? Not even three years ago. Yeah, not even three years ago, right? But now we can do that. So we have the power now to change it because of the internet and social networking, and that's what we need to do. What I want to do is I want to take a break, and when I come back, I want to bring you all in and also be joined by John, Donna Lisa Fisher, professor at SF State. I want to go back into time and kind of deal with it from this standpoint. People talk about, well, it's just a movie. You know, these are just movies, why are we tripping? But there were some landmark movies that came out in the 70s. And one of them, which we've never escaped and had, I think the biggest impact, uh, was a movie called Superfly. And it came out along the same line, same time as the movie The Mac, 
Uh, it came out the same time as Spooku Sat by the Door. It came out the same time as The Legend of Nigga Charlie and Soul of Nigga Charlie, which was actually Django before Django, right? Um, but the thing with Superfly was it had all the bells and whistles. And there are documentaries online that talk about how the fashion changed. And the filmmakers are proud. Like, we made people start wearing long trench coats. And people stopped wearing afros and they started wearing perms. And here we are 40 years after that movie. And people still quote it in rap songs. And they still reference it even in the way that they, they talk about their swag. And so can a movie just be a movie? Understanding, as you said, the machine of Hollywood, understanding the types of impacts. And if, if we can have a 40-year legacy just on a couple of movies in terms of, like, you're seeing, like, people who weren't even born still reference that um, and still are informed by that, then what sort of things do we need to do so that they can go in another direction permanently and not, you know, live off a, a certain type of legacy? So let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll continue. Mm. We're back here, we're talking about uh, images, Django, everything beyond. We have filmmakers, professors, cultural critics, the whole nine. Uh, the diaspora in our community, we have Idris Hassan, a filmmaker. We have Sean Kennedy, entrepreneur and the creator behind uh, Good News Oakland. We have uh, uh, Dwayne Dutterfield. Dutterfield. Dutterfield, jazz expert. Uh, Part of the Moroccan Society, uh, uh, Oakland Maroons Art Collective. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Oakland Maroon Art Collective. When I say when you say the word maroon, automatically go to San Kofa and the whole nine. So okay, Beautiful. there you go. And then we have Donna Lisa Fisher. She's over at San Francisco State. Um, she teaches a number of courses. Among them is technology as well as black images. Um, and so we want to talk to her as well. Um, before we left, I wanted to take us back to a movie like Superfly. But alongside it, there was a bunch of movies. The Mac would be another one. Um, and it was a period of time in the 70s where these were just movies. And many people were excited to see them. The themes are kind of similar in terms of what we're looking at when we see Django. You know, the, the downtrodden, the underclass, the person who you least expect is going to come up and save the day. And I use Superfly as a, as a referencing point because when you look at the documentaries around it, they talk very deliberately about they wanted to change the fashion statements. They wanted to change the lingo. They wanted to change a whole lot of things. And they brought this character named Priest who, for many people, when we were growing up, and we couldn't see that movie in the theaters, and there was no YouTube and none of that stuff, uh, so we were too young to go. We saw the posters and we thought he was a pimp. It wasn't until I was an adult and got to see that movie that I realized he was a cocaine dealer. And he was snorting cocaine like every two minutes in, in the movie. And then you listen to Curtis Mayfield. He's like, the movie's soundtrack is great, but I was afraid people might glorify cocaine. And at the time, people said, no, Priest will be that hero and people will get the message. But 40 years later, you know, cocaine has been more than just glorified in our communities. Um, the whole pimp culture or whatever is something that is with us to this day. And a lot of precisms are still around. So I want to start with you when we talk about it just being just a movie. Um, using that, you can look at the Mac as another example since we're here in the Bay Area. Same sort of impact. Um, and a number of other films that have really gone on to inform our art. Yeah, yeah. I want to say just in general, though, the whole issue about it being just a movie. One cannot uh, reduce the power and efficacy of Hollywood film because uh, narratives and the myth making that comes out of Hollywood in many ways is much more powerful than actual history. It's much more powerful. It moves the masses much more powerfully than actual mm -hmm. history does. So the whole thing about it just not being a movie. As a matter of fact, the, the paradox is, is that because the audience thinks of it as just being a movie, that's mainly what gives it all of its power and belief is because they casually take in these images and, and, and falsehoods. But there's a, I'm going to um, contrast a couple of movies and, and, and show what happens with some of these things, right? So Shaft comes out 
and Shaft has a, a, a protagonist in it, a hero in it, who's raising money basically to get some brothers out of jail who are in a, a radical, uh, a radical movement. Right. So the backlash against Shaft really was Superfly. Yes. Was to again make this individual who's not doing really anything for the community. So but Shaft is, is in basically the reflecting the militant times of the seventies. Exactly. And so, and the entire notion of the black exploitation flick is a backlash against the black arts movement which has come up since about 1968 or so in, 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 in full power, really. And so they take things that were um, uh, a lot of it being African-centered and having radical politics in it and wearing of African clothing, things of that nature, and they try to commercialize it. When I say they, I mean the, the empowered white males in Hollywood who saw an opportunity to make money off of it and turning it into something commercial, empowered uh, uh, themselves to turn it into a fashion statement and if you make something that comes into fashion, you can have something that goes out of fashion. So it's a way, I believe, of shutting down the power of the black uh, 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 arts movement, which is basically the cultural wing of the black power movement. This is right. what was expanding things ab abroad. I want, I want to make one more, one more contrast, which is the, the movie Spartacus, which is also a, a you know, so-called slave narrative, but it's from ancient times, right? But you have it written by this cat named Dalton Trombo who, got, who was blacklisted, and the, the hero Spartacus is actually trying to free slaves, right? Free all these slaves, a whole group of folks. Fast forward then to the year 2000, you have the movie Gladiator, which people talk about a lot too. Gladiator really is this guy who works for the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. and he's basically doing things for himself. You see what I'm saying? So they always shift things from being for community, for masses of people, and once they find, figure out that, oh, wait a minute, this narrative has come up that is for, um, uh, empowers the masses of people, they change the narrative so that it focuses on an individual and the individual story. So now we look at Django mm -hmm. and compare Django to Sankofa. Right. Or some of these other movies, you know, like Quilombo and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Django is, you know, is insidious well, well, in that matter. One point with that, and then I'll bring you in, Don, um, going back to the individual. One of the things that stood out with me with Django was he never really talked to the other people that were enslaved. Exactly. He exactly. never really, it was never yeah. like, brother, you know, we're free, let's go do this together. It mm -hmm. was very much an American, like, it's me, me. Me, me only. One in 10,000. Yeah, right. Yeah. One in 10,000. <laughs> that, that Donna, Lisa. That was an, I had to just jump in on that one because uh, that, that was striking to me. That, of course, there's an obvious juxtaposition of Django versus Sankofa. Mm -hmm. But being, having studied the legend of pejorative N word Charlie and all of its sequels, Fred Williams and all of these personalities, and also Dave Chappelle's uh, remix of it in Time Haters. Oh, yeah. If you look at, so Dave Chappelle has this skit called Time Haters, mm -hmm. where these it's where these pimps uh, travel back in time and hate on haters. So they they do something to Hitler, and the, the last one in their Time Machine uh, skit is that they go to a plantation, mm -hmm. and he uh, uh, shoots uh, uh, a, 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 a white man on the the, the overseer mm -hmm. or plantation owner, I'm actually confused about it right now, but um, so he, so time haters, when you look at the legend of Charlie mm -hmm. and the, the media, the, the, the Fred Williamson in the middle and then the character who would have been Samuel Jackson's character uh -huh. in the past, but is, and, and the other character, that's who Charlie Murphy and uh, the, the Chappelle's cast were embodying and it was the three of them together. Now one does play that scared person and run off right before he shoots this, the plantation owner, the white man. But, uh, but what's interesting and about the, the, both Time Haters, the remix of this narrative, and The Legend of Charlie, which are our non-progressive mm -hmm. narratives, right, is that it's the community together. Billy Preston's song, called Inward Charlie uh -huh. is about Charlie he needed his brothers we did it together uh -huh. and so uh -huh. I was shocked I but not I, I shouldn't have been shocked but <laughs> but I was I was uh, the juxtaposition uh, not just Django versus Sankofa but Django versus the legend of Charlie versus time yeah, haters yeah, where yeah, it's us that. together it's I just feel, like yeah. F y'all yeah. right. I'm not even I, I mean it wasn't just the white mediated uh, why don't you guys free yourself? Like, really, you're gonna hand this person a gun and they're not gonna shoot you? Like, seriously, and run off even if it's to death? That's wild. Like, seriously? That's wild. But, but I mean, it was just, it took, 
it made the legend of Charlie see, which is poorly yeah. made, see, progressive. Yeah. So I just had to jump yeah. in on that individual versus. Uh, yeah. Well, let me ask you another question. I want to bring in the rest of our panel. You teach a class. You teach, you've been teaching black images for a while. Uh, from your students, what do they take in? I mean, are these just movies? In, knowing that students are taking in a lot of things, I think Sean was talking earlier, we have YouTube, we have a lot of things. So it's not like the movie is the big event like it was even 10 years ago. I mean, there's so much information going. So since you teach a technology class and you're teaching black images, when you were before these classes, you know, with students, 18, 19, 20 years old, what is the mindset, you know, when, when you're dealing with them? How do they interpret? you know, many of these things that we're talking about. Well, first of all, I have to give enough respect to all of y'all for the critical media literacy work that you all do every day to help us free our minds, free ourselves, raise our self-esteem, and a constant barrage against us, our identity. Uh, Stuart Hall says, uh, popular culture is where we learn about ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're getting, every day our, our kids and our peers and our seniors are getting images about, are getting information about themselves from the avatar that they have on their words with friends or script, whatever the newest game is. The avatars are white. <laughs> the avatars are, are white and overwhelmingly male. Not even just that black white binary. There's, uh, there, there's not representation of any identity, Asian American, Native American, etc. So the avatars on our games are white. The avatars in our video games are white. Or this black exploitation image throwback. Um, but also, how we deal with our media, how we, this on-demand media consumption is very short. So I wanted to just jump to, so of course it has an effect on us, it has an effect on our self-esteem, it has an effect on, on uh, uh, our, our, our everyday practice. So I mean, it's, this work is very important. My, my two sound bites that I want to say is if people really want to learn about slavery, if people really want to learn about critical media literacy at the, at, at, at the, at the university, it's not going to be from Quentin Tarantino or even Spengler and Goldman. It's going to be from an Africana Studies course. There are classes where we learn and where we read the original text and there's resources. So if we want to raise awareness through these films, that's one thing, but there's actually ways that we can learn about it. I have to say one thing, one last thing though. I saw Django in the movie theater close to campus where David and I both teach. And so I was in the theater in a situ interesting situation with my mother who's 64 somewhere around there, you know, and went to segregated schools all through, even through college it was segregated. She had to travel outside of the South to get to an integrated school. Uh, and our students who are 18. And my mother and I, you know, uh, when we left the theater after the movie, the two hours and 45 minutes, right. she, was she was shocked. So I was like, wow, this must, but I, you know, it's Quentin Tarantino, it might have been all the blood and like the, the man being torn apart by dogs, these graphic scenes for a 60, which were hard for me. I turned, I couldn't look. I, right. I, that's just not, I don't do that. Right. So I, I covered my eyes like I do. And I, I, but uh, but this, the, the 18 year olds that do watch this often, that are used to it, were shaken. And I saw some of our students, African American students, on the phone crying. Like literally, there's this one young lady in the bathroom on the phone crying mm. to her mother talking about how she just saw this movie. And I thought, well, well was we watched- Was she crying out of empowerment or? No, she was upset. Th these, my, my theater was different from some of my yeah. colleagues. Uh, our, Dr. McDougall saw it in Chicago and he said people were, black people were laughing and so forth. I don't know if we should right. But um, <laughs> what I'm saying, my theater wasn't like that. The, uh, in, in Daly City where I saw it, um, the white, older white men in front of me were like this like on their knees like this and uh, our uh, some of our African-American students were literally were angry upset having emotions and so I thought well some of these people literally are the same people who I've taught roots to and there's that moment where I cry every semester where Ki where uh, Madge Sinclair Bell is her kizzy her baby's being Peace. born and um, and and uh, the father off the Brady bunch right. I forget his name He's whipping her and she's like, Mama, Mama. She's like, No, Massa, not my baby. It makes me cry every time the idea of her baby being sold. And, but that's a one minute clip in color adjustment by Marlon Riggs. And then it recovers with the Cosby show. So, what my point of this sharing the story is, I don't think our students, or in that matter, m many people of a particular generation, are used to sitting through three hours of those kinds of graphic images. We log on, we see a video clip, 
We may even see a one, 10 minute clip, but to be sitting stuck in a theater and you can't multitask or tech, well, you're not gonna really right. text if it's yeah. a good movie, right? Or if you're, if you're engaged. To sit there and watch those graphic images one after another, I think had an effect. Okay. Um, not, not, not a pause, I mean, but, but, I, but I, I, that was something that I, that I was. Which, which, which makes us start to question now and want to really turn the critical eye on Quentin Tarantino for having criticized Roots for its quote unquote authenticity. Like how, how does he do that? How does he empower himself now to start speaking about that particular narrative, which is right. actually based in a real history. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's really based in some, in some real history. And I think what you're saying is true. I, I don't think the, the overwhelming majority of the public realizes that Roots was a long series of, 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 of of films, right. you know, that, that went over a period of, of, and of it, a week. it also sparked a lot of fights in places. Sparked yeah, fights. It was a cultural phenomenon right. at that at that particular time, and it was, was one of the most watched television shows ever <laughs> right. at that particular time. Let me bring you and Sean, uh, your thoughts on some of this, and you know, maybe juxtaposing it with some of the heroisms that you are raising up with Good News Oakland. Um, well, I, I want to comment on the Superfly thing. Okay. Go back to that for a second. I think when I look at Superfly and I look at how, um, you know, we started wearing perms and things of that nature and started glorifying hero heroin and stuff like that. Did you wear a perm? Yeah, I wore a perm. Did you really? I had wow. a perm back in the day, like in <laughs> the early 80s. Wow, okay. Yeah, I had the French braids. I had the um, Shirley Temples. I had all that stuff. I had curly hair, too, but it's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing that I want to say about that is that what I recall about that, you know, because I was born in 69, so yeah. that's 73, 74. I remember that because I had aunties and stuff that was partying and stuff, you know. Um, but I remember brothers showing up with perms and stuff. And when I think about it and look at what we did with marketing and how we sell ourselves back to each other, I think that what Hollywood was able to do back then was to get the, the popular black people during that time and let them wear that style, that culture. And it was what we were already doing. We were already in that transition. So we just, they, Hollywood just took that image that we were creating and sold it back to us. And then we made, they made it seem like, you know, it was created out of Hollywood and, and that, you know, this was exploiting who we were. But we actually gave them that image to exploit. And when I look at the rest of these films and stuff, um, Django and all the rest of the movies that's out there with, with African-American Jamie Foxx and stuff, um, we need to really turn the eye on them and ask them what do they think about changing history for people who don't even know their history. So when, you know, like, when you see Samuel L. Jackson on television and say, oh, you shouldn't have been to Uncle Tom, are we actually looking at a whole set of Uncle Toms? Of people who understand the power of media, Jamie Foxx crying in the background. I mean, he's a trained actor. Wouldn't you cry if PR told you to? I mean, this is all, this is all well choreographed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this is happening um, by strategy. This is not something that just is happening. So if I hear Jamie Foxx crying in the back, I just think PR automatically. Now, I don't know what the rest of the American public thinks. Hey, let, me, let me just share with folks that listening to Sean, you're not speculating because you were part of that machine. It, one of the best of the best when it came to promoting. You know, I remember down here, you know, you would, you would bring those sorts of, uh, we call it guerrilla theater, when it came to promoting records and do those types of, scenarios that would leave us like i remember one time you had a bunch of people in uh, uh orange jumpsuits right. promoting a record i still remember that from like 15 years ago and we had to sell yeah, yeah. the image that you know yeah, we right. were in jail yeah you know? so so with that in mind so you you clearly recognize that so what do you think they should be doing so um you know the things that we're doing is not telling people that it's this particular narrative. We just show them a good, positive story. So just tell a good story. Just tell a good story and, and make it an authentic story where people, and, and, and a story where people say, you wanna know what? Um, um, this is something that we go through. And then also what we've done is we've taken the Dr. Dre's, these people who created this narrative of gangsterism and everything else along, you know, getting that money. We've taken these people and just said, um, you know, 
ask them about what's good. And they, you know, they, they live two lives. One of their lives is, ah, oh, Dr. Dre is, is, is the man. But then another life is that he can't stand the image that Suge Knight might beat him up. So, you know, so, so he got bad news in his life. Right. You know what I'm saying? Regular bad things are happening. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so when you tell him, Dr. Dre, man, you're going to be on good news, he's like, good news? Because it's almost this thing nobody never heard before. Mm. It's this thing that everybody want, but don't nobody want. You know what I'm saying? So what we're doing is that we're just taking it and we're just presenting it to the people without telling people, well, you, you know. making it relatable. Right, yeah, so people can, you know, dial in and, and right. be a part of it. Go ahead, Idris. I want to say one of my icons um, in terms of black media and images is Gordon Parks. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't like what I'm seeing and my camera is a choice of weapon. So that's what our media is for us now. It is a choice of weapon because there is strategy going on. We cannot forget that we live on a country, I mean, live in a country whose foundation is founded upon how can we best demonize black people? How can we best make our, build our economy off of the degradation of black people, the suffering of black people? This is our commodity. Right. in this country. So with Gordon Parks, when he even made Shaft, one of the first black filmmakers, he had a strategy with his filmmaking. And I think as media makers, as educators, like you say, when we're dealing with the roots, with the kids, I, you know, I'm an educator as well. And when you give kids a foundation, when you give them a background, when you give them an understanding of culture outside of the media mainframe, Right. They're like, wow, I didn't know this. I, you know, and they're and they're sparked, and they and they want to tell these stories that are of their lives. Our young people are dealing with violence, and things going on in their communities on such a tremendous level. So there are all these stories just waiting to be told. We don't have to go create more violence and, you know, fictionalize it and reference Tarantino. There's a lot of healing we can do with that. Can we do it without? We're gonna get ready to wrap up. Can we do it without Hollywood? It seems like y'all are doing it without it. Can I, yeah. Yeah. can I drop some, I mean, Bay Area Cypher, by, these are films that we get to teach by Idris Hassan. Our, stu my, our students are empowered when they hear about Julie Dash, mm -hmm. uh, Oscar Michaud. Mm -hmm. They watch films, Killer of Sheep. Mm -hmm. So many people are upset that they've never heard of Killer of Sheep till they get to college. Yeah. And some people may graduate never having heard of well, it. Well, there's a lot so. of people that don't know what Killer Sheep is. Well, can you let them know? Professor Cook. You let them know. This is, I don't know Killer Sheep. I never heard of it before. <laughs> Charles Burnett. I, I'm thinking of my my. Never mind. Uh, Charles Burnett, Julie Dash. This uh, amazing moment in time. With, well, I mean, so if you were following the Freestyle Fellowship and uh, Lamert Park uh, kind of cultural arts movements in Los Good Angeles, Life Good Life Cafe. Yes. Then prior to that. In these, these, these beautiful jazz communities, we have films like Killer Sheep, you could probably get it online or Netflix. Um, yeah. And then Julie Dash, Daughters of the, Daughters of the Dust. And the, the, it hasn't stopped. There's Idris Hassan sitting right here in the room. Ava DuVernay just won mm -hmm. Best Director at Sundance last year for yes. Middle of Nowhere. Um, what did Brother Greg Tate said when, when, when San Francisco Chronicle said the middle of nowhere was, I forgot what they called it, something like painfully slow. Uh, we were chatting that it looks like someone's waiting for Monique to throw a television at someone. If there's something wrong, we need a psychiatrist. We need a psychologist. We need an intervention when the public can't see black images being black Im the normal black images when we Sorry. need someone to be blowing someone's brains out or throwing a television at mm -hmm. someone and cursing someone out when that's the only way we can consume these images there's that that's that's, I, that's when i scream intervention I heard that. okay thank you for your intervention <laughs> last comments from you Dwayne. wow after all that one of the things that i thought of when you were just mentioning the names of those films was that you know i guess california here in los angeles in particular we got a a, a nice history of folks being assertive with that because Haile jerema was part of that yes. crew out of ucla with all yeah. those folks that you just named right the, that first wave of, of filmmakers and so i'm feeling like there's a new renaissance here too with all the new media that the brother just mentioned good news we've got you know idris here and uh, i want to mention the name david roach in, uh, david in roach. oakland with the oakland international film festival sam styles yeah all Adrian Anderson? I, I, I think that, yeah, I think Kevin that, Epps. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I think that that, that place, um, that festival would be a good place to continue this discussion and put together a team of folks that would be image producers, and I would love to be uh, a part of that so that we can actually, you know, produce a, uh, some sort of communal, collective image. Uh, My question machine. was, we, so we should bypass Hollywood at this point in time. 
oh, we should have been by, but Hollywood has never had our interest, uh, best interest at heart. And I want to say this too, is we need to stop um, using them as the paradigm in some ways, you know, sort of subconsciously. Let's get rid of Bollywood and Nollywood. We, we don't need any of the woods <laughs> at all, you know? We, we don't like need the woods, like, literally. Like, like literally, we don't need the woods. You don't like people <laughs> wood? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. But you see what I'm saying? People <laughs> Yeah. So, so we need to think of our, our, ourselves now with this new technology as being, is this is the 21st century and cha it's going to be a game changer. That's what we do. I think that's what, what black folks do. You know, right. we touch the ball, it's you know, game changer. Well, I do want to thank you all. Sean, any last comments from you? Um, I just want to keep hope alive in the words of Jesse Jackson. No, I, mean, I, I think that we all should be empowered now that we do have this new technology to go out there and start changing, you know, our, our just our what happens in front of our house. Right. Um, that's important. Um, everybody who goes into a city, into a community, um, leaves out of a house, which is in a community. And that's where it all starts. So right. it starts in your neighborhood and it goes beyond that. So I believe that if we start telling the stories, um, you know, what happens on 89th Avenue in East Oakland. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not drive-bys every day. It's little kids out there playing and people out there parenting and doing things like that. Yes, sometimes it's a hazardous neighborhood, but most of the time something's good is happening. So if we can empower because of the 21st century, just teach the young people how to use their cameras, their camera phones, right. post up the positive stuff. Then as those images get out there more and more and more and more and more, um, then we'll- and That becomes the norm. That becomes the norm. And you know, as we close out, where that happened, and then it disappeared almost overnight, which would Bill Cosby. Because in the middle of the crack epidemic, in the middle of the scar faces, in the middle of the uh, New Jack cities was, you know, Bill Cosby. Uh, there was uh, a different world. There was all that stuff that was going on and people really enjoyed it. And what I found interesting when you go back in the time, there, were, there seemed to be people that were positioned. You, you, maybe they were the Samuel Jacksons of that time. They're like, oh, that's not real because, you know, in Brooklyn, that's not how it really is. But it's like, well... What's wrong with, you know, having this type of scenario uh, be there? And when that type of criticism came up, it wasn't so much that somebody had that criticism. I was very watchful of how that criticism got elevated by folks that never liked our interests. Wow. You know, so it was like, oh, you said it? Let me put you on the cover of Rolling Stone. So suddenly you're sitting there going, who's this critic that <laughs> just popped up that's now... You know, talking about that's not how the hood lives, you know, and they were all of a sudden, they became that, that person. Mm. And you would see that play itself out as it crossed over. So you might go down to the local radio station, and you remember, you know, we needed to be more street. And that would be the thing that they would tell black folks who, they would tell this to, to folks who weren't from the, who, they weren't from the streets, but were demanding that you be more street. Almost like you put on that caricature. Like you're not real street, you're not real That's street, you're not real. Like, yeah, you like, you're not keeping it real. See before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> so, so fear, I get fear of a black hat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> it's the difference between a B and an A. Yes. Well, look, I want to thank everybody uh, for being here. There's a lot of other people that uh, we should definitely shout out. Uh, Race for time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Cueco and yes. uh, Raid Soldier. We had. Uh, uh, Ishmael Reed, uh, we have uh, Cecil Brown, uh, we have Kevin Epps. There's a lot of folks that are around here, Jack Taliaferro, a lot of folks that have been doing stuff for a very long time um, that could have also been here in a part of this discussion. And we would just want to encourage people to know that there's a wealth of information, there's a wealth of, of opportunity. Even our camera crew here, you know, many of them are Filipino who are sitting there one day saying, you know what, uh, we don't like our images either. And they start their own, you know, got their stuff together mm -hmm. and, you know, started recreating their own images. So a lot of the folks that are on our network see, you know, their own selves empowered and that has got to continue. So shout out to everybody. We're out for now. Peace. <laughs>